with the uh, horrific events that are going on in Israel right now, how are we as Christians called to respond? And is this a sign of end time prophecy? Welcome to this week's episode of The Follow-Up, where we recap this week's sermon so you can grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus. I'm here with Pastor Garrett and Pastor Adam. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Carrie. Hello. Yay. We're wrapping up our Dear Church like mini-series today, mm -hmm. diving into the full chapter of Revelation. You guys had a lot. Full chapter three of Revelation. There oh, we go. Man. I saw your look in my eyes of like, that wasn't right. It was a full um, chapter. Full chapter full three. Chapter, yeah. But you guys had three churches to cover, which was, this was like a buckle up. We had a lot to go oh, yeah. through. Yes. Quite oh. the journey. Yeah. But it was great. Yeah. We kept yeah. it moving. Yes. yes. We kept it moving. Yeah. We had a little Indiana Jones theme song oh, going. You did? I did yes. do a little bit oh, of that. Oh, that was great. I didn't do it Saturday night, but uh, <laughs> Sunday, both services, I did a little... Dun, 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 dun. At the following the red line yeah, yeah. the map oh, yeah. oh that was cool dang it yeah, yeah we did time. that you know yeah time. just following that pathway mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you guys got this okay we've got a few questions that we're going to dive into and then we've got quite a bit coming in from the congregation yep. this is a big chunk of scripture so i'm excited for us to kind of dive into a little bit more about these three churches so first question starting with the church of Sardis. Um, how does the warning to the church in Sardis ha about having a reputation for being alive, but being dead spiritually, as it talks about in Revelation 3 verse 1, speak to churches today that may focus more on external appearances rather than spiritual depth? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> like you guys, you guys both look at each other. Who's going to take guys, it? Yeah, who's, who's going first? <laughs> Well, I think, I think the big thing when it comes to reputation is the contrast of that is what is real, what is, what is authentic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the, um, really, I think it challenges the whole mindset of what does it mean to be faithful as a church or what does it mean to be successful as a church? And sometimes people assume that large, large churches are compromising mm -hmm. in some way and small churches are, are the faithful ones, but really it has nothing to do with with the size. It has everything to do with what is the focus, what is the driving force, what is the means by which the work of God is accomplished within the local church. And, and so within that, I, I think the, um, the reminder that it has to be led by the Holy Spirit, because unless God builds the house, the workers labor in vain, and, and to use the means that God has provided by his spirit, by his word, so that it's not a manipulation of emotion, that it is not just about getting numbers, that it's not about growing the church on anything other than the work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so to base it on that and not to rest in any false notion of being a healthy church or a successful church based on the excitement in the community for that given church. It has to be about, yeah. has to be about Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like the idea that it's nice to have like this nice outward appearance where like, well, look at us. We're cool that we have these new things. But I, when I was thinking about it uh, in the beginning and even now after, as we've kind of gone through these churches, like it's all about the heart. It's all about uh, our kind of heart posture. And if it is uh, all thinking about like, okay, well, how can we get uh, more butts and seats and how can we get more people to know the brand that uh, is our church, but you really have, have forgotten like what our heart posture is before God and that when we forget that then it really is just like, Oh, well, we're just going through the motions that we're just going through appearances and we're trying to make sure that people see us as a church, but we're actually not really doing true real ministry. Right. Yeah. And I think that goes into the whole aspect of we're not here to make a big name mm -hmm. for our church. Yeah. You know, at spring Lake. It's not about the name of spring Lake. It's about the name of Jesus Amen. and keeping that, keeping that primary is yeah. so key. Awesome. Okay. In Revelation chapter three, verse five, it is promised that the one who overcomes in Sardis will be dressed in white. And what does the imagery of white garments symbolize in the context of salvation and righteousness? Mm. 
Yeah. So yeah, it was really interesting. This is one of the things I didn't, that I don't know. I didn't really get to cover it in, uh, when I was going through, but, uh, white clothing was, uh, kind of the standard for going into, uh, temples in Asia. And so it was something where like you couldn't go in if your soil of your clothes were soiled. So you had to have these white clothes. But now as we go talking about God's temple and the new creation that's going to come, that we are going to be clothed in white. And it's kind of symbolizing this holiness and pureness that we have, but actually it's not that we have, it's that we have been bought at a price and that our clothes have been soiled, but through what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection, that our clothes finally get to be white, but it's not by our works, the things that we have been done, but solely through the work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. so true. So good. And even I think reflecting back on, um, Isaiah, Isaiah one, where Mm. he's talking about though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And so seeing that, how that is through the finished work of Christ, like you're saying, Garrett, and in Daniel, we see the one, the ancient of days who sits on the throne is white as snow. So we're going to be like God. We're going to have the righteousness of Christ. And so those that endure, that are faithful, that Jesus has called and saved, we have that hope that Mm -hmm. regardless of our struggle now, that we are going to be pure. We're going to be like Christ, something to look forward to. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So the church in Philadelphia, so switching over to the next church, is commended for keeping God's command despite having little strength and talks about that in Revelation chapter three, verse eight. How can churches today remain faithful and steadfast in the face of challenges and limitations? You want it? Yeah, Yeah, I think, I think, um, within that of staying faithful in the midst of things is, um, I think what's so important with that is holding on to the promises of God, you know, and, uh, an honest, uh, perspective of what it means to live a life for Jesus right now. The whole sense that in following Christ right now means that we have to deny ourselves Mm -hmm. and, and we have to pick up our cross and that is going to be difficult and to realize that following Jesus, we're under no false illusion that that makes everything a cakewalk right now. But when we realize what Christ has done for us, when we realize um, the hope that Jesus gives and the promise in store for us, we realize that the greatest struggles that we face and the things that come against us cannot change what Christ has already secured for us. And so with that hope, you don't base your hope based on what you're going through in the moment or the circumstances or how hard it is or what you see going on around you, but based on what Christ has secured mm-hmm. and realizing that in that, that strengthens us for whatever comes our way and gives us uh, the means and the reason to stay faithful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always... I'm thinking when I think about this is that we want to have this idea of we want to look ahead, but not around. Mm-hmm. That can be really easy just to be caught up in our circumstances of what that we're in right now, especially as we like coming off COVID and sometimes we've been just in a, uh, and this culture has been just at a crazy point where it can be really easy just to see where we're at and just see the parts where we just struggle and it's hard to just to see it with everything that's right in front of us or been right behind us to really just get lost in the negativity and get lost in just the struggles we're in. But if we keep our eyes just locked ahead of what's going to happen, we get to see that Jesus, what he has done and how there is victory in him. And he says it all throughout the churches, like to the one who is victorious, that there's going to be this reward that's going to be there, that there is going to be victory for you. That if we don't just, uh, so if we don't, if we focus on what is ahead of us and not just the circumstances around us right. and momentary, I think that's just a good mindset to have. Right. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I like that. Now, the thing that you said about instead of like looking forward instead of around, that mm-hmm. at least gives you a good frame of reference to be like, okay, am I focusing on things that are going around, mm-hmm. like on, that are happening around me, or am I going to take my eyes up and like look at what's yeah. what's coming ahead? I really like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not like that we even like and like deny what's going on. Like Correct. it's true, like living like a reality, like things are hard and we yeah. never want to say like, oh yeah, deny uh, that like life is tough right now. And it is, but the reality is that the, I forget, is it in Romans where Jesus says that doesn't, whether, whatever the struggles that we're facing right now, it's nothing to comparison of what we were way to glory. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you've been thinking, I mean, back in the day, I used to run track. Back in right? the day. Can you, imagine, can you imagine that? Back in the, back in the day, that guy ran. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it would have been really bad coaching if, 
the coach would have allowed me to go looking at the stands as I was sprinting in mm-hmm. because the whole idea yeah. of, a, of a sprinter mm-hmm. was you had your eye on, on the finish line mm-hmm. and that's what kept you running and running in a straight line and yep. not being disqualified by running out of your lane. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking at, you know, um, your parents or your friends in the stands, you're not going to run a really good race. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea of looking ahead and not looking around, that's, that's good. Kara. Yeah. I like that. In Revelation 3, 20, Jesus stands at the door and knocks, addressing the church in Laodicea. How does the image illustrate Jesus's pursuit and invitation to individuals and churches? And how should this be an, in, how should this be an invitation to respond to? Hmm. Uh, oh gosh, I just look at this and I really tried to really hone in on this yesterday. It's just such a sweet uh, picture of just intentional pursuit of Christ. And I know uh, like in my time in college, that was such a, like an, just an idea that I needed to hear that like God just has loved me so much and loves me so much and is just in such pursuit of me and he's outside the door and he's knocking hard and he's knocking clear and he wants in, but I'm the one, I'm the one that's holding the door and saying like, Oh, I don't know if I want you in, but he sits out there and he just, and and even for the ones who have come to him, but then maybe a straight away that he's still just consistent pursuit of them. I just think it's such a great image. It's not also, it's not to come in and to, uh, uh, to harangue on the more and say like, this is what you're doing, but I want to come and I want to dine with you and I want to be in this intimate relationship with you. I just right. think it's such a, such a, such an awesome picture. Right. Yeah. I love that. I love the fact that it's so personal. There's not all these hoops to, to go through that. It's a Jesus right there for any of us that have blown it, that have been ignoring him, that, um, the opportunity is there to acknowledge, man, I've been ignoring what Jesus wants for me. And he's right here Mm -hmm. and he desires to have a relationship with me. I mean, just the other week, um, we experienced at our house doorbell rang and I kind of looked out and there was someone that I did not want to answer the door for no one from spring Lake. Okay. It wasn't (laughs) one of those kind of things. It was someone with a clipboard and something Mm -hmm. to hang on your door. And I'm like, I am not going to answer that. And they rang the doorbell again dog was barking. It's like, I am not going to ring. I'm not going to, I'm not going to open the door, you know, and I ignored and they ended up leaving. Right. Um, and, and we all have those, those opportunities, those things that come our way as far as who do we open the door for? Mm -hmm. And the fact that, um, Jesus loves us so much and it's so personal. He doesn't just send somebody, but the fact that we each have this opportunity when we've blown it, that Jesus is right there to embrace us in. And the fact that he says he'll come in yeah. and he'll eat with us. It's like, man, we might've made a mess of our lives. Jesus says, I'm going to come into your messy house mm-hmm. and I'm going to eat with you. Mm-hmm. And as ashamed as we might be, the fact that when we open the door, Jesus is willing to step into the messy house mm-hmm. with the dishes piled everywhere and everything else that might not be in order, mm-hmm. but he desires to have fellowship with us. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful picture too of how we get to model that for people in our life. Right. That the people that we pray for for years and years and years that they would come to know the Lord, that we might be knocking outside that door and we're just, um, and we're patiently waiting and that we're open to coming in in the mess as well. And we as believers being okay with getting knee deep in other people's junk and other people's grossness and other people's lives that are, that we try to keep hidden sometimes. Right. It's just a beautiful picture of that because we know that we, Jesus did that for us. Right. And now we get to share that right. with other non-believers in our life. Right. too. I think when we talk about grace, um, there's an aspect of grace that as we talk about it, it should cause people to question, is grace really that good? Mm-hmm. Is it really that powerful? Is it really that transformative? Because it seems too good. Mm -hmm. And the answer should be yes. Mm -hmm. That grace is better than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. That in the deepest mess you find yourself in, Mm -hmm. that that God God can reach you right there. You know, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to move into some of the questions that we've gotten from the congregation. So we had somebody write in. And ask us, after reviewing all the letters, um, what, st- oh, let me, let me regroup this. Um, our, when we were looking at the churches and the letters from Sardis in Revelation 3, verse 5, 
are the names in the book of life written in permanent ink or is it written in pencil? Mm. That's a good question, right? Because he's saying there to the one who is faithful, I will not blot out their name Mm -hmm. from, from the book of life. And so then the natural question is, well, wait a minute. Does that mean that for those that aren't, that he does Mm -hmm. use some white out or, you know, an eraser there? And then the question is, wait, does he, does he write it then blot it out, then write it again Mm -hmm. if we repent? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, a couple of thoughts, a couple of thoughts on that, unless you want to jump in first. No, you, you, okay. Yeah. You run with this. Uh, a, a couple of thoughts on that is that we have to remember that salvation is wholly based on the finished work of Jesus mm-hmm. and not ourselves, that it's not based on our own works, our own merits, that it's based on the finished work of Christ. Right. And that, um, the book of life is something that, um, that God, that God writes, that's not based on how well that we are performing, but based on what Christ has accomplished for us. And there's a couple things within this that, you know, the Bible talks about, um, I've written these things so that you may know, that you have eternal life. So as we read this in Revelation 3, it's not meant to be something that causes us fear. Like, did I just do something that's going to upset God? And now I have this hanging over my head, like he might erase my name. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is an appeal for faithfulness, right? Um, Where John refers to those that left because they were never really of us. And so the faithful believer, it's a sign that that person is someone that genuinely has followed Christ. But interesting as I was studying this, um, you know, a a little bit is that in Psalm 69, you have uh, the psalmist talking about those that were unrighteous and coming against him. And he's just, he's just upset. And he's saying, God, um, I, I want you to blot them out of the book of life. I don't want you to forgive the, you know, the unrighteous, basically those that are coming against us. And in that time, um, or in, in the time of the New Testament church, there was something called the curse of Menon that um, the Jews in the synagogue were actually um, playing this out against the Christians that God would blot them out of the book of life, like in Psalm 69, that they would be considered among the unrighteous, not true worshipers of God. And it almost seems to be that God is answering that here, that no, you are, you know, going through these things, you're being faithful, but I'm not going to blot your name out. You are the righteous. You are the true worshipers of me. And so instead of it being something where we're fearful of, is God going to white out my name out of the book of life? We should see it in the positive that God is not going to do that for the person that is genuinely following Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it is a call for us to remain faithful. Sometimes the questions that come out of that is, you know, Hey, my, my kid, um, you know, said the sinner's prayer when they were four years old. Since then, I've been seeing them make all these decisions. Are they saved or are they not? When it comes to the individual decisions like that, we don't know the person's heart Mm -hmm. and we don't know what is truly genuine or not. We know by fruit, but we don't know the long term. And so unfortunately, when we're trying to gauge, is someone saved? Is they not? And try to have some peace of mind Mm -hmm. with that. The greatest peace of mind that we can have is, Stay faithful Mm -hmm. and know that salvation is based on grace through the finished work of Christ and not what, not what we've done. Mm -hmm. So with that comes, uh, hope and a certainty of, of eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. Mic drop. Mic drop. There we go. Okay. In revelation three 10, I'm going to say the verse and then go into the question. It says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. So this person asks that in her um, NIV commentary for her Bible, the phrase keep you from in the Greek can either mean keep you from undergoing or keep you through the hour of trial. And where, where do you stand? Which one do you think it is? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, like it definitely comes on 
it really depends on like where you're coming from. If you're coming from more of a pre-mill uh, dispensational that the Christians are going to be taken up out of the world and then the tribulation is going to come or uh, it depends if you're talking about uh, maybe, uh, one of the different views of that um, Christians are going to be here and there's going to be persecution, there's going to be tribulation. But when God says that I'm going to keep you from it, he means that I'm going to continue uh, to have that you'll persevere through it that in the way that you have been enduring through the persecution of these Christians that are trying to make you deny the name or shutting you out of these places of worship that uh, since you've been faithful towards me I'm going to uh, strengthen you that you have little strength and that you are going to make it through and out of the persecution that is going to come yeah yeah I yeah and with that you know as we look further on you know we see like when the fifth seal, is is open we see the those that have been martyred for their faith um that that are there under the altar and uh jesus talking about more that are left to join them so and, and even later on where the beast is given uh power over over the saints and so there is a picture of you know uh believers going through difficult Time. So mm -hmm. um, I personally would look at um, Revelation 3.10 as being something of, you know, God sealing and um, enabling believers through a time of intense persecution, through intense difficulty that were not um, necessarily rescued from that. And I think that is also in line with even what we see happening ar around the world. I think sometimes mm -hmm. we we read our Bibles uh, with an American mindset yep. and we forget that there are believers around the world right now fervently following Jesus and going through incredibly yeah. trying times that we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for us, some of the, the, the difficulty is, you know, when the AC is not working. You know, when, when, when we, when we worship, it's like, man, it was so hot in there. Or man, I had to sit next to somebody else and there wasn't a whole lot of, whole lot of arm room, you know, and, and we consider that as something difficult. And, you know, the things that people are suffering around the world, um, I mean, it, it's, it's eye opening. And so I don't think we should read Revelation 310 as being something that, hey, we are just protected from hardship. I like that. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Last question. Whew, here we go. So with the uh, horrific events that are going on in Israel mm -hmm. right now, how are we as Christians called to respond? And is this a sign of end time prophecy? Yeah. I think first thing that we really want to talk about is that like just that really, we said that is just like horrific and I think from uh, like a pastoral sense and from our church that we, I think one of the most important things we do, even as Christians, is just we can be in continual prayer uh, for what's going on, for the situation that's going over there, for those who are being uh, killed, those who are being innocent, those who just happen to be in the area and, um, and being affected by this. So we can just continue to pray over the entire situation. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is so sickening. Yeah. You know, when you see the videos and you hear the stories that are coming out and on, on one hand, you know, we look at it through the lens of scripture and along with the lens of scripture to have a heart for the people that are, that are suffering. Mm -hmm. And so our response needs to be truly a godly response to reacting to any injustice or horrific event that goes against uh, the innocent. Um, and, and so with that, you know, we need to be praying you know, for, for the people of Israel, for those suffering, for those grieving, for those still in the midst of so many things that are unimaginable for us, you know, as it comes to, you know, is this actually leading up to, uh, the very end, you know, when we consider the end times, because technically, you know, all of the church age has been the end times, yep. right? So we've been living in the end times now, Ultimately, I know when people are asking, is this, you know, the end times, we're meaning like, is it the end end yeah, times? This is the beginning right, of right? the end. Is, yeah. is, is this the beginning of the end? And we don't know, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think it's safe to say that, that we don't know. We don't know the day or the hour. Um, we do know that um, in the end, it says that there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. 
But also, even during World War II, there were people that thought that, that was the end. They thought Hitler was the Antichrist, you know. And so, um, whether or not this is the end um, makes no difference in the sense of our own readiness. Right. You know, um, there's there's a difference in the way that you live if your wife is nine months pregnant or three months pregnant. Mm -hmm. Nine months pregnant, you have the luggage ready to go. You're ready to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Three months, you're like, oh, we got a lot of time mm -hmm. left, right? We, we got a lot of time left, so we don't have to be ready. Well, we're always supposed to be living as though our wife is nine months pregnant and going to have the baby at any moment. Yeah. And so we're not to live in a way where, um, oh, it's, it's probably not going to be for a while and we can, we can take it easy. So we do know that in some way, in God's sovereignty, this is leading up to something. It's a sign of the brokenness and a reminder that Jesus is coming back. But how we respond right now needs to be with, with prayer, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and in that sense, being careful as we hold our Bibles, that it's not always like the newspaper in the other hand. And how does this line up with what the Bible says? Uh, I think there's some things generally we could say, but in all of it, um, to make sure that um, our theology as it comes to the end times does not in some way desensitize us mm -hmm. to the very real tragedies that, that are happening yeah. and just take a theological stance without having a, a heart for the people that, that are suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. So to wrap up this week's episode of the follow-up, Adam, would you just pray for the country of Israel and just for yeah. us as believers to have a, a right response when it comes to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Father, our hearts go out um, to all those that are, that are suffering in Israel, God, something that uh, totally took them uh, by surprise and God, we cannot imagine uh, what that would, what would have been like and, and what those that are suffering um, right now, what, what that is like. And, and yet God, um, we just pray that your hand would, would be in the situation. We know that even through uh, the mess, even through injustice, God, that, that your plan can be worked out. But God, we, we pray um, for, for your justice. We pray for your protection. We pray, God, that um, you would protect uh, the innocent. We pray that your righteous and your justice would uh, come down on, on the guilty. We pray that through this, God, that people would embrace Jesus as their Savior, regardless of um, which group that they are a part of. And God, we pray that as believers, that you would help us to live uh, ready. God, help us to be prepared for your return, that as we've looked at uh, these letters, God, that whether we've been uh, comfortable, coasting, apathetic or God just struggling uh, to remain faithful when we feel weak. God, I pray that we would draw our strength from you, that we would repent of what we need to uh, repent of and God help us to be faithful, assured of the victory that is ours in Christ. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's episode of the follow-up. We will see you guys next week. Bye.